Sama Sambuddha Sam, Namatasa, Bhagavato Arahato, Sama Sambuddha Sam, Namatasa, Bhagavato Arahato, Sama Sambuddha Sam. Homage to him, the blessed one, the worthy one, fully enlightened one, we pay homage to him. Sadhu, Sadhu, So, I'm here. I'm still here. <laughs> In Poland, and it is much cooler here for me. <coughs> they say I'll get my voice back, but we'll see what happens. <laughs> So I think what I'm going to do is the commentary first, then we'll go through that sutta. Because the sutta does cover this to some extent. And so let's dive into the commentary that I just finished putting together first. Okay. Oh, that's good. That did wrong. I did that the wrong way. Just a second. I have to go out and try again. Um, hmm? What am I doing wrong? Okay. You can't see that though, right? Um, well, let me see if I can get to it. Um, hmm. Bhante, what am I doing wrong? You there? Yes, I'm here. Uh, maybe whiteboard. Oh, you wanted whiteboard? Or yeah. you want the share, share screen? I want the whiteboard, but I can't find it. I think it, it would be there on the right hand. I can see it on the right hand. Uh, the whiteboard is there as a separate item. Something's happening the wrong way. On the I don't bottom know the right, I can see the whiteboard. Wait a sec. Can you, can you put up the... Can you put it up or not? Can you? I can't. Oh, but I can't. You. Huh? I have. To, I have to manage it. Maybe uh, share before. screen and see if you find. Uh, okay, uh, share board. screen. Uh -huh. Whiteboard first. Then I have to go to find them, right? Yeah, you're there. I think so. Okay. Um, I'll do it this way. Commentaries. Okay. So, this is. Let's see, this is Gunter's questions. This is the wrong one. <laughs> Let me see. Um, hmm. That's Gunter's questions too. Cool. What happened to the commentary? <laughs> um, uh, do you want me to put up the commentary? Yeah. I okay. can't find it. It's somehow I double saved it or something. I don't know what I did. Okay, okay. I, I then I I'll put up the commentary. One second. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you have to end it. It won't take me long to go through this. If you hang with me, mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll, you're going to have to move the screen, I guess, if you put mm -hmm. it up there, huh? Okay, I, I'll do that. One second. Mm -hmm. All right. So you just roll down the uh, screen. Now, let me let me talk to you a little bit about what this is about. See, this there's is the been, yeah, there's been a lot of questions. You can roll this down because this is what I'm going to do. Uh, I want you to think about as you practice, what is the intended goal of the twin practice? OK, then I want you to um, see uh, what does the meditation? Why does the meditation object change during the evolution of the practice? And how does sending to the six directions help us to reach our intended goal? And how can this be useful in everyday life? This is what people are talk, are asking about. And there is some confusion with the way that we're writing books and we're not coordinated the way we write books, I'll tell you. <laughs> so, I mean, they might be writing them here and there and everywhere now, it's really popping up everywhere. So we're not really talking to each other when we do write these books and they might not come out saying the same thing, but I promise you, I can help you with this. Okay, and we can straighten it out. So you can roll down, okay? Okay, so um, when let me move this guy over just a little bit there, okay. We're learning, we're learning TWIM as a skill that's to be used all the time in life. 
it's different than other practices that have been presented in modern times because they have left the idea more strongly that you you go to retreats to be together to have retreats and learn something and you practice there but the actual thing is or you go home and you hide in the closet or get away from the kids and everybody and you find a place to meditate at home but they don't really talk all that much about going into life and where all this started happening with Bhante Vimala Ramsey and and I worked with him for 22 years for those who don't know I've worked with him for over 20 years, well, be 15 years that I was with him almost every day and went to all the retreats he taught all over the world and went around the world two or three times with him, you know, doing this. And I can tell you that I audited these and I examined them and I started doing the first writing, but I never published. <laughs> So I kept writing articles about this or that for you and putting them up online over the years. So this is who I am. And now I'm over in Poland working to inject this practice into something that will spread all over into daily life. That's what I've decided to do for the, this time that I'm over here. And so what it is is happening here, we're learning to skill and we hold retreats with a guide uh, interviewing us each day for 10 days to deeply follow our progress. And these guides, when we meet you once a day, we can catch from what you're saying to us what we need to say back to you. It's a skill that you have to learn. And you actually tell us what we need to say back to you if we listen very carefully with five questions that we ask. But the main part of learning this is done by ourselves, by you, okay? As we test everything that we are asked to do as we are going along and learning this practice. You're not supposed to be believing anything we say as far as fact, absolute, net business at all. I have no idea where some people got that idea because we have never ever done that. We are totally against that. We follow the Kalama Sutta very closely, which was a, something the Buddha left for everyone to read and to understand that you shouldn't believe something or accept it unless it's working and operating for you. And this practice is structurally something that makes our lives easier and we are able to deal with people better. We are able to sleep better. We're able to eat better. We're able to, to do everything better and have a lot of fun with it. That's the thing. And I think because we have fun with it, people actually do take this home from the center if they come for a retreat. And they actually, there are some who really do follow through, write us back and completely change their lives. So that's what this is all coming from. Hold on a second. Um, hello? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm in a class. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm in a class. Who is this? Okay, you can get on online if you can. If you would get on, you would learn a lot from this. I thought I sent this to you, but I'm not sure. It's a Zoom class. It's just, just starting now. I don't know if you can do it. All right, let me let me let me let me give you the number. Okay, it's 716-3034-3034-3799. And then it's 1234 and you can come in. Okay. Okay, jump on. Thanks. That's quite funny because he has the same question. <laughs> okay, so um, we're testing ourselves as we go along. And the Kalama Sutta was an emphasis the Buddha left for people to remember that he teaches strictly a different kind of approach than what was being taught back in the, his time, where gurus would basically say, you do it this way, that's what you do, and you do it, and that's it. No questions. Okay. But what we're doing is question everything as the Buddha directed in some of his suttas, question everything and don't accept anything unless it's actually working to help you with your meditation, okay? So 
here we go. The Eightfold Path is a complete support system for us to learn this practice. And during our meditation, we principally learn to practice the four steps of right effort. And that's because this has been lost in oblivion for a long time. And we're reclaiming something that was there all the time in the text, but nobody's reading the text anymore. Basically, when we started all this, nobody was looking in the text. Okay, they were looking in other commentaries for the advice and right effort was viewed as hard work. But that's only one definition for effort. And this is four steps of right effort. It's not four practices either. It's four steps of one little practice that we're trying to bring alive again. So right effort is a very important fold in the Noble Eightfold Path. It's number six. Six, seven, and eight have to do with um, the right practice or the uh, right effort, the concentration, and the, the mindfulness. Those three pieces are in six, seven, and eight of the Eightfold Path. Right effort's really important fold in the Noble Eightfold Path because we hear about it in most traditions of Buddhism have preserved the name of it, but lost the actual little practice and how important it was. So there are four, you can roll it up just a little bit. There are four active steps that we do. Um, okay, that's enough. Whoop, down a little bit, down a little bit. <laughs> okay, there, there are four active steps that we do when we practice right effort. The first two steps are meant to purify mind and the last two steps are done to retrain our mind. There is no shortcut here. One must do all four steps to achieve any um, permanent change when working, uh, any lasting change, when working to let go of any troublesome habits and create new alternative behavior instead. And that's what the Buddha was trying to do. One head of the Pali department, um, you know, um, in Peridinia, University of Peridinia, uh, and he brought up the fact that bhavana has always been translated as development of mind. Yeah, but he also says it's a development of behavior. And when you put that into the text, you get a lot more out of it if you try that one too when you're reading and see if it means development of behavior because it's a development of behavior patterns. That's what it was. So the four steps need to get indelibly into our mind so that they eventually become automatic. The moment you feel tension, I want you to try this. I want you to think, never mind. And the moment you think, never mind, I want you to let go of the attention off of whatever came up. Now, this is a little different than the six R's. I'm coming back and looking at this very carefully and trying to show you it's just the four, okay? Recognize we added, but that's not exactly what's changing anything. You have to see it. So the moment you see it is when you say, ah, never mind, let go of any attention on the unwholesome state and then relax your mind and your body will follow. You don't have to do anything with your body. You don't have to do a body scan. Nobody told you to do that. We never gave you any instructions for that. We just said, relax your mind. Why didn't we give you instructions for that? Because mind and body are connected. Because if, I, if you think lower my blood pressure in my mind, my body responds and lowers my blood pressure. Yeah, I can calm my circulatory system, my digestive system. You can learn how to use this by learning how to teach your mind to respond to your intention, yeah. So then you relax your mind and the body will follow. So it's not necessary to worry about that. As you do this, you just do it. This is how you purify your mind. So these two steps are just purifying your mind. Then you bring up a counter wholesome state, which is practiced a lot in the suttas about hindrances and things. When something comes up, you take the alternatives. So we found through testing with hundreds of students that the easiest way a smile works perfectly because of what a smile does anatomically to the human being, 
a smile works perfectly as the alternative state. And by immediately smiling, your smile uplifts your mind. Go ahead, smile. Just smile and see what happens. Your mind feels open and it's wider and it's more relaxed. Mm -hmm. And it sharpens your awareness for early detection the next time that you repeat that step. So when you're training your mind, and then the next step, the fourth step is returning to your object of meditation and continue observing just to see what happens next, please. You do not have to do anything with this. And this is one of the reasons why the Buddha took six and a half years to find this. This is one of the reasons for it. He couldn't figure out that you don't have to do anything. And then suddenly he has a memory in 36, in Majima Nikaya number 36, section 30. And you look at that and you, if you don't understand that, you go out and sit by a tree yourself, alone in the forest somewhere, put a blanket down and sit by the tree and just, just sit and don't think about anything and see what happens. If you just empty your mind and keep smiling and sit by the tree. Yeah, you'll see what happens. So returning to your object of meditation to continue observing just to see what happens next. All four steps are done smoothly in only two to three seconds. There's no time for a body scan. There's no time for anything. You just never mind. You let go, relax, smile, come back. That's it. Bingo. It's done. There's no, no Greek to learn, no space technology, no computer program to learn. You just let go, relax, smile, and come back. That's all. You do not think about any of the steps. You just do them. Okay, we can roll up. Mm -hmm. Roll up a little bit. One page up. Go ahead. Up a little more. One more. Okay. Oops, down one. <laughs> down one. Okay, uh, down a little bit more. <laughs> down a little bit more. I don't know what happened. You got to come down, down more. Down, down, down. Right there, okay. This is how you retrain. Whoops. Down one, uh, down one more. <laughs> this is fun. Okay. This is how you retrain your mind. As you keep on repeating these steps, you are helping your brain to set up a new neural pathway so that it will eventually take over this response whenever tension and stress begin to appear. You would not believe how fast this is working for people now. So this practice is reclaiming what is suspected to be the original four steps of right effort, as noted in the text several times. Right effort is also called right striving, which gives us the clue that you keep on striving in this precise way until the brain begins to do these steps automatically. We have another case in the 37 requisites of enlightenment where the, uh, you know, you have faculties and you have powers and it's the same thing. And we all used to say, well, why are you talking about these five things uh, twice? Because the first time when we call them faculties, you're learning to do them. And when we call them powers, you are allowing them to happen automatically. That's what most of the teachers will tell you. Okay, now, if you refer to, uh, I'm just gonna give you these, I'm not gonna go through all these, but if you go to Majima Nikai number 77 in section 16, you're gonna read exactly what I wrote. There's a couple things there. You're not gonna see the relax step or the smile step, and I'll tell you why in a minute. And then you read 78, uh, which I'm going to do that. I'm gonna read that through for you, but I'm gonna finish this first, okay? Um, Okay, uh, why don't you see the uh, relaxed step and why don't you see the smile step? People like to gripe about that, <laughs> okay? 
First of all, the monks were not walking around sad sacks, not smiling, and generally keeping straight mouths with no smile at all. It wasn't happening that way. There are places in the text we can find where it's noted, like in 89, section 12. If you go to 89, I think it's section 12 in that. Um, you will find an account of the monks smiling and their pleasant position, disposition and pleasant mind and pleasant energy that's coming off of them. And you'll find out people like that don't walk around frowning. So we don't quite know how this happened. I used to say, well, maybe it happened because they weren't making progress and they were frustrated. I don't know, but you're not supposed to walk around smelling with your teeth showing, <laughs> okay? An Arahat never walks around with his teeth showing, but we don't have to worry. There's not a lot of Arahats around right now. So, all right. So basically with 89, you go to section pretty much 12, okay? And in that section, you're gonna find them talking about, I see Bhikkhu smiling and cheerful, sincerely joyful, plainly delighting with their faculties fresh, they're living at ease, unruffled, subsisting on what others give them and abiding with a mind aloof like a deer. And I have thought surely these venerable ones perceive successive states of lofty distinction in the blessed one's dispensation since they abide this way. You see, so the kings and people were giving them gardens for them to spend their reigns retreat in because they were so delightful for the people to go and see. So, you know, why people think that this is normal for them not to be smiling. And a lot of us, a lot of the monks today have gotten over this. <laughs> They begin to see that if your mind is free and your mind is open and you're understanding this, you probably are smiling, okay? So let's go down one more a little bit. Even with this little bit, okay, stop. Even with this little bit of information, you can begin to see that twin works towards waking up and restoring something. It's restoring a natural communication system that is inside the human being that perhaps we all started out with in life when we were very young. And there wasn't a big clutter in there and there was no dictionary and there was no encyclopedia in our head. It was just a clear, clear head you know, a communication system where if you, you thought, I'm going to go see that, you would just walk towards it and see it and your attention would be there and nothing would bother you. No hindrances, no thoughts, nothing. Then you would want to say, oh, look at that flower. And you would walk over toward that flower and you would just immediately just look at it and nothing would stop you from examining it. You go and watch little children. You need to go to a park and watch little children, how their minds are clear, how they play. They don't get confused until they start imitating adults too much. <laughs> That's how it all happens. You know, you want to understand what's wrong with your children, you go look in the mirror. Don't blame it on them. You have to look in the mirror and watch what they're seeing. And if you see that, you begin to understand you made mistakes here or there, and we all do. So you, you straighten out, you change, you do something different. So now even, even with this little bit of information, you can see that it begins to work towards waking up and, and there's more communication. So what are we trying to do with this? We are trying to send something to ourselves. So we're pointing to ourselves the loving kindness for 10 minutes when we first start. Then we're taking a a spiritual friend, and we're going to aim and we're going to point to them and we're going to shine to them, but we're not going to send, we're not going to push, we're not going to make anything happen. And that frustrates a lot of people today. They want to feel like they're in control and they make this happen. And I'm going to tell you something straight up because I've met people who have been trying to make something happen for 10 to 25 years. And they've never been able to make anything happen. And they come to us crying because all of a sudden we told them, stop trying to make anything happen. Stop trying to do anything. Just do the instruction. Just follow the instructions. And none of it tells you to do anything. It tells you to witness, to watch. 
And there are some big people with 12, 15 PhDs out there who don't want to let anything happen. And it's almost impossible for them to think about letting anything happen because they always made everything happen. But with this, no way. All right, next one. In the original training plan, a new monk would come to learn about and work closely with three things before formal training begins. Dana, Sila, and Bhavana come first. So Dana means practicing generosity. And it's simple. It's in the form of kind thoughts to the people you're living with in a group, kind words, and kind actions. It's consideration of the other person first. You want to read a good description of it, you go to Majima Nikaya number 128, section 11 through 14. That's a really pretty good description of what it's like to be living, not thinking about yourself and being narcissistic and everything's about me. And all of a sudden you're with a group of monks and you have to live thinking of everyone around you first and not how it's just going to work for you it can be a shock. To understand how that worked well for everyone involved, I told you to read these sections in the Upak Kalesa Sutta, Imperfections is the name of it. And those specific verses, 11, 12, 13, and 14, are the description of how three monks were living together. It's perfect. I gave it to the Boy Scouts for their camp out, and they said it was much better. <laughs> so in the beginning of this sutta, three sections set the mood for abiding, diligent, ardent and resolute in harmony together, okay? And, but why is this so important? Well, the simple fact is that if you don't, uh, then the practice will not work. For the generosity you practice will soften and prepare your heart for successful practice and learning. The minimal five precepts will protect you from distractions coming up to bother you in your meditation. And this is simply put a fact. You don't have to believe me. Each of us must find out through testing for ourselves. You feel good when you give something to another person and this puts your mind in a good position, a good mindset for meditation. It helps you, okay? Uh, let's see. Okay, stop. Not killing or harming any living beings on purpose. This is your five. This is all the lay person needs. Not stealing, not practicing wrong sexuality that leads to painful bodily or mental pain. Not using harsh language, gossiping or slandering anyone. Not indulging in drugs or alcohol that cloud our mind sets a person up for clear meditation. That's what they're for. These also protect you from troublesome distractions coming up like feelings of lust and greed, hatred and aversion, sloth and torpor, drooping heads at work, restlessness, guilt and remorse or doubt. And precepts make life run right without our energy getting clogged up by these things. So the precepts serve as an umbrella against the hindrances. They're over you all the time, protecting you from them coming down and attacking. So kind, now it's good to note that here that this duo is not being pressed onto anyone because of some kind of organization or some cultural demands, but it's simply because this just operates the best way one can operate when they're doing meditation and there's no arguing with it. If we investigate why it's not working, we almost always find the precept you broke or we find something else that's going on that you're not letting out and taking a precept again and going forth again. It's not time to beat yourself up if you mess up on a precept. Don't beat yourself up. Let's stand up and fly right and just go again, you know? 
Everybody fly right, everybody get up, everybody keep going. That's the way you get free in your mind. You keep working. Kindness to the self and to others puts you in a ready position for successful meditation. So setting yourself up for this meditation is wonderful. This is the way that you do it by understanding the kind of help that you have from the precepts and from understanding the hindrances and understanding uh, the way that this all works as an umbrella to help you. Okay, when we begin our practice now, remember this is all about learning. It's about the communication system. And when I talk to you about the communication system, it works like this. When I have an intention, I would like my mind to follow. My intention, it doesn't say me, I am supposed to get in between the intention and what I want to have happen and push and make anything happen. It didn't say that. I didn't say that. Okay, when we practice, if we have set things up properly and we are in a comfortable posture position too, it won't be long until we experience longer sits and we feel some uplifted joy. Now, this is called your PT. And PT is uplifted joy, the word for that. And it's a marker, a marker for reaching first jhana. And that's the first jhana. And that's all you need to know about that is when you feel that come, you're right there in that first jhana. Don't worry about what jhanas one, two, three, and four. Don't dissect them. Don't, don't for heaven's sakes, don't analyze them. Just go through the practice and we'll help you as you go along. You'll, you'll be getting to a place where you really understand it. There's too many charts out here right now about this and this, and you're supposed to be sitting this many hours. And those charts were not made to make you feel that way. They worked very hard on those charts to show you the average person is sitting about this long. They're all just maybes. They're not precise. This is not a precise thing. You put 100 people in the room, you got 100 different speeds, 100 different levels they're moving at, 100 ways that they're doing things just, you know, to go through within the instructions. So when we practice, uh, they feel that joy. Uh, it's a marker for the first jhana. And when you feel PT, you usually you want to see what else can happen along the way. So when you're sitting a little longer, the, the, the new person says, wow, that's cool. What else can happen? And the moment you feel joy come up, we need the page to go up a little bit, <laughs> down a little bit more. Yeah, down. Bunty, we need the page to go down. Okay, wait. Uh, I keep losing it. Okay. The moment we feel joy come up, you can also check to see if your spiritual friend is smiling too. Now, your spiritual friend is something you used in the beginning. The only reason you sent anything to yourself is because we have an issue with people today in the world. A lot of us hate ourselves. We hate what happened when we grew up. We hate what our situation is now. We hate this and we hate that and we're really angry. You know, that's a problem. And so when you, you know, when we're doing this practice, you're uplifting yourself and you need to let go of all of that. And so the moment you feel joy come up, you can check to see if your spiritual friend is smiling too. You send it to yourself in the beginning only to fill up your tank. You can't give something to somebody if you don't have it yourself. Just remember that, all right? Here's a crystal, here's a big crystal, see? I cannot give this to you if I do not have it in my hand, can I? I can't, okay? So I have to have this in my hand before I can give you one or some of the energy from this, I have to. And that's all this is about. You send it to yourself first, then you start sending it to one friend. So now we're learning to point, to point, to help ours, our brain learn how to respond to our intention. That's what we're doing, okay? The moment you feel the joy come up, okay, I, that one, okay. This is a good sign because you might also feel lighter in your head and it might feel, you might, your head might feel a little bit larger, uh, like it is full or it's starting to, things inside, when you close your eyes, things might feel like they're 
they're expanding. And that's a good thing. It just means you, you are entering the boundary of infinite space. It's just another level. That's all it is. Okay, you can stop there and you can have a look around at, at how vast it is in the stillness. And, and by now you might be feeling like some of the body parts you have are disappearing. And it begins usually with your hands and your feet and upwards up your arms and legs and even through the torso. And you end up, if you keep sitting and you're sitting long, many times a person says, it feels like my head is sitting on a table and that's all that's there. Just this table and this head, you see, that's it. And some people will say the head disappears. Okay, this is a good sign. And it's, um, that's what we say, you need to roll it down a little bit more. When the, okay, when the feeling moves up, the meta uh, naturally changed into a softer feeling and the strength of it diminishes. This is natural. Everybody's getting so hyper. My meta was this strong. And uh, whatever's happening, when it moves up here, I want it to stay that strong. And your poor little meta is trying to change uh, from a worm into a butterfly, <laughs> you know? And here you had this little worm coming up here and then it's gonna change into a butterfly, light as a feather. And compassion is soft, soft like cotton ball. And so when it moves up, it changes to a softer feeling, the strength is diminished. And this is perfect, it's nothing wrong. And you don't need strength now uh, that it's up in your head, okay? When the feeling reaches into your head, that's where the metta and karuna are coming from. So you're from your head and you do not have to make anything happen here. Uh, you just need to experience it as a witness and allow everything to happen. So you just give it permission to be free and develop it as, as it will. Don't try to control the feeling. Most important thing is for you to get out of the way and just be a candle sitting on a plate, shining into the room. That's all. So if you wanna know what you have to do, you go home and make a room dark, and then you put a candle on a plate, then light the candle and sit there and tell me how much does that candle push the light into the room? That's how much you're allowed to push. Okay, that's how much you're allowed to push. You shine. And they had lots of religious songs about, um, I'm gonna let it shine tonight, I'm gonna let it shine. And then they tell the story of Jesus or Allah or somebody else. And they say, we're gonna shine, 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 shine. You're just gonna shine. And that means you're smiling. You've gotta keep smiling. We have to tell people all the time, smile. All of a sudden they sit three hours. <laughs> you know, what's wrong? I said, when I was first teaching, he said, well, you're not telling them to smile. He said, write the instructions. I wrote the instructions, he says, they're no good. I said, that's what you said. He said, you listen again. I know I said smile at least five times. I went back and I had to do the whole transcription again. And he smiled, said smile. 17 times during his instructions. He's trying to make you smile. Because why? Because it uplifts your mind and sharpens your observation. Good enough for me. So when, the feel, uh, when this happens, you do not make any move or to anything to happen. So let's go over what these markers were again. You can roll the page up a little bit more. Okay, so the markers we watch for, and you can watch for them just as easily. I'm trying to put them in the order they usually happen, okay? The feeling of loving kindness is starting to move up into your head. Now, when is this bad for somebody? I'll tell you when it's bad. If you're a teacher, you need to know this. It's bad for the person who hasn't been able to feel anything in their heart for a very long time or something really big and bad happened to them and it was a hard experience and they locked their heart shut. It's hard for them 
for this feeling of loving kindness to come on. And there are some ways that we work to repair that, to, to uh, cleanse that problem out, which is called a circle forgiveness meditation. But you have to learn that separately from this practice. It is not the same practice. It is a cousin to it because it cleanses everything else. So this will work, but it isn't the same practice. You have to learn it separately. Okay, the spiritual friend smiles back to you is the second one. And you sense strongly that they are happier too. You'll sense it or you'll just sense it and you might not see it. Some people can't see their face. And you begin losing feeling in your arms, legs, like they're gonna disappear. And you feel lighter in the head. And uh, when your eyes are closed, you sense that things are moving away from you and it's the edge, the edge of the infinite space. And the texture of loving kindness is less strong and getting softer like cotton as it turns into compassion like we discussed. So those are the five points we just mentioned. Now, when one or more of these signs are coming up, and let me tell you, it used to be we would not do this unless all five signs came up. But gradually, about four or five years back, we started to experiment when he did his tours abroad with me. We started to experiment and we realized that some you can you can do it if just one of these things happens. But you have to be careful because you don't want to push the person if you only one thing happened and you start to go to the next part. They might have some trouble. It might be because um, they didn't uh, have enough of these things happen. So let them go back and let them build it up a little bit. But the one thing is I want you to understand at this point, when you're going to start this next level, you do not go back to the beginning of this practice anymore. You do not go back and start to build yourself up from the beginning anymore. Those were just things you did in the beginning of the practice to get going. We have too many people who we never find out. They somehow we're not clear enough about telling you never go back to the beginning and never go back through the people again and all that stuff. Going through the people, I want you to understand, this is where we're going to go through the people next. And when we go through the people, it's just a quiz. It isn't even worthy of calling it a stage of meditation or a level of meditation. It is simply a quiz for your brain. That's all it is. It's time for the brain to show you what it's learned to this point. So roll up the page one more time, okay? Okay, stop. So what do I mean? The next practice is just like a quick quiz for your brain that you would have on Friday in some class in school. Not serious test, not big exam. It's a quiz for your brain to see if it is learning to follow your intention when you point your intention to some other kinds of people. That's all you're doing. It's quick quiz too. And you must complete it in one sitting of one hour and no more. And your intention when you point to some other kinds of people, um, you know, it's, oh, wait a minute, I missed something. Yeah. Oh, you can sit. You can sit for one hour and do it, or you can take two half-hour sits. There's some people who are doing half-hour sprints and 40-minute things. You can do it twice like that to get through them. And if you can't get through them, it doesn't mean you go back and start at the beginning again. If you get through some of the people, okay, then you go and continue from there to finish the people. That's all. Okay. So you receive specific instructions. And yes, the design of this comes from, of all places, the Vasudhimaga. That's where it was caught and preserved in the Vasudhimaga from one of the uh, commentaries that were preserved in Sri Lanka when the Vasudhimaga was built. But the uh, approach of the practice follows the twin approach exactly. Okay, it follows it exactly. So um, this is a test on pointing and shining 
into an intended direction towards each person, one at a time till they smile. Now you are questioning the brain with each person that you process. Can it respond to follow your intention like it did with the first person? So my suggestion, I think I'm at the end, but see if you roll it up one more time. Okay, oh, okay, stop, stop. Um, okay. Um, why are we doing the six directions is because we're testing the brain to see if it'll just follow your intention. When you complete this, you then learn the six, six directions instructions and your training uh, mind to obey wherever you point in your mind's eye, in your mind's eye. It doesn't mean you have to just look in this direction. You're going to close your eyes and just think forward, think backward, think right, think left, think up, think down, and then think up and all around. That's it. That's all there is to it. So you are training mind to just obey you, uh, obey wherever you appoint point your mind's eye and you just point in that direction and you train mind to obey as you just sit still and shine like a candle. That's all. There's no, no complex stuff here. No space math, <laughs> no physics, you know, that's all. There is no sending, delivering, pushing, ordering, or controlling in this practice. There is obeying the instructions, not bending them, not, if, you know, people come and we tell them in the very beginning, you have to do this purely. Do you want to understand how purely you go to 72, go to 72 and section 18, I'll read it to you right now. And it says, it is enough to cause you bewilderment, Vacha, eat enough. He was Vacha came to visit the Buddha. He's talking about all the things he's tried, all the places he's gone, all the years of this and that and the other that he's had. And here's what the Buddha says about it. Enough, Vacha. It is hard to see and hard to understand. It is peaceful and sublime, unattainable by mere reasoning. You can't learn it by reading. It is subtle. You have to be watching it carefully and closely to be experienced by the wise, to be experienced by those who understand the dependent origination the way that we're showing you. How precisely does the, uh, does the suffering actually work? And if you have learned that, and many of these suttas are not going to tell you that in the sutta because the person learned it before the sutta was taught to that group. This is common knowledge among these people who are training in the training camp. It is hard for you to understand it, he says, when you hold another view, accept another teaching, approve of another teaching, pursue a different training, and follow a different teacher. Well, you can't be more plain than that. Do not mix apples with oranges with grapes with bread and butter. You don't do it. What we're trying to show you is a very simple thing. And I think that to a large extent, we've talked about this, that the problem for TWIM is it's too simple. It just couldn't be it. Because we're faced with 150 or 200 years of thinking it's extremely complicated. And we have been taught things far too long disjointed as this one, that one, that one, this one, one at a time, instead of telling you there was a tapestry, there was a Dhamma cloth that came together. Everything in it feel, works to make the clock operate. Have you ever looked inside a big clock, the old fashioned ones to see how they work? Look at all those pieces inside a Swiss watch sometime. Amazing amazing and yet they all serve and work together perfectly and that's what we're trying to show you this is not a cubby hole thing like this you see for instance one of the cubby hole issues was meeting someone once who said we said what is your practice and the person said feeling and he was responding because he had been studying satipatthana 
and he had body, feeling, mind, Dhamma. He's working with feeling. Ah, feeling. So are you seeing perception and, and everything? He said, no, I'm practicing feeling. And I got a funny look. I didn't understand that he had never seen 43 and 44. <laughs> And 43 and 44 are question and answer sutras that you need to investigate. If you have not been there, you need to investigate. But there's something problem with this. Can, can a person practice only feeling? No, they cannot. Because why? Because perception, feeling, and consciousness are conjoined. Mm -hmm. Perception, feeling, and consciousness are conjoined. Then you cannot... Practice feeling without experiencing consciousness and perceiving the feeling and what it is. Yeah, you can switch into the other document, Bonte, okay? Into the other one. So this is something. Uh, you put up questions, the, uh, questions, the document. Hunter's questions, yeah, put those up. Okay, so, so this is something that you have to pay attention to. This wasn't a disjointed thing. It was joined together. And when... If we, if we are not guided from the beginning uh, about the Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, the three characteristics, and we are not guided um, in understanding some basic foundation information first, then when you get to certain suttas, you can't understand them and you're going to assume they mean something else because you didn't have the foundation material to understand the sutta. So it's a bit of a problem when you say, I'm going to get a degree in this, but I go at it one suit at a time for one year to dissect it. And you get, you get a prize for that, but you, did you really get all the information of the, what this was all about and how it can impact the whole world? No, usually not. It didn't change. That's not it. Maybe I can get this one, Bonte. Um, I can get this one. Can I do it? Is it okay if I try to do it? Okay, try. Let me Please try. try. Um, yeah, okay. Now, before I do these questions, um, I will address smiling and I will address relaxing so you understand. One of the things we have in preservation for Buddhism is we have the pres certain suttas are key pieces that we thought were key for all different meditations. And one of those is Anapanasati instructions. So if you go to um, 118, if you go to 118 and you look on page uh, where the instructions start, okay. You will find out that within the instructions that are all these pieces are supposed to be operating together while you're doing breathing meditation. It's not either or. And you'll find out breathing in long, he understands. Breathing out long, he understands. Breathe, um, uh, he, breathing in short, he understands. Breathing out short, he understands. Um, I breathe out short and then I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body. He trains thus, I shall breathe out experiencing the whole body. It is not body of breath. If you have the old edition before it was changed by Bhikkhu Bodhi, okay, that's a first edition, second edition, after third and fourth and fifth edition, I think it is, you're gonna find that there is, it is not, um, of the body, it is the whole body he's talking about, you see? And the note concerning this, we're not sure what happened, but when it was changed, if you go to, um, I'll explain where it is. For those who wanna know, if you go to Sutta number 10, is the Satipatthana Sutta, okay? And if you look on page where the instructions are found, if you look on page 146, you'll find he understands I breathe in short. He understands I breathe out short. And then it says, I shall breathe in experiencing the whole body, breathe out experiencing the whole body. And there's a note, 141 is the note. And that'll explain why Bhikkhu Bodhi changed it. If you're a Pali scholar, go and check it. 
because this was something Nanamoli decided it meant the whole body of breath, but there is no body of breath. And that causes a bit of a discussion that he never talks about it in this way anywhere else. And so part of that, you go and look for yourself. The note is 141. Okay, on this one, um, let's see, where am I? Um, okay, so I'm, what I'm trying to show you is in those instructions on 119, I'm sorry, 118, the instructions, as you go along in the next paragraph, it's going to say, um, tranquilizing the bodily formation. Yeah, tranquilizing on the in-breath, the bodily formation, tranquilizing bodily formation on the out-breath. And then in another paragraph, it talks about tranquilizing the mind, mental formation, and tranquilizing the mental formation on the in and out-breath. So this becomes a standard operation in all meditation that needs to be happening all the time, all the time. And so when we notice what happens when something comes up, when we reach over and grab onto it and hold on to it, where tension and tightness is concerned is there. When we have the tension and tightness, we're holding on to what that is. When we let it go, we can go oh, like that. That's okay. Okay. That's okay. But the relaxed step is extremely important in the process because when you release something, like when I let go of this, I didn't relax like that. I just grabbed it and see this, I release, but I'm still up here. I still have a lot of tension in my arm or I reached over to grab this. I just let it go, but I still have this to let go of. So letting go of what I held on to is one thing. And that was where Bonte figured out something. If you relax, they put in the relaxed step, you will find something happens that's wonderful. You start going down a little bit more each time deeper and deeper, each time with less and less and less and less tension. And that makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Because where are you going? You're trying to get to a level where the seven enlightenment factors come into alignment, where you're all the way down the path, where you're ready to fall into the state of cessation. And what is the state of cessation? cessation? Cessation of what? Cessation of all tension and tightness has to happen in order for you to be able to go down into that state and then come out and turn back on. So that's, that's, that's the importance, the big importance of the relaxed step. Now, the smile step, I'm not going to go into because I already kind of read it to you. It shows up in section 89. We all started practicing that. And we found out that uh, in the research for neural, uh, you know, um, for the neurocognitive science, for the research for the brain and how it works and everything like that, you have to keep the brain very light and open. And you have to keep repetitiously doing something to let go of an old habit and create a new habit. And so when you're changing behavior, you have to do it the same exact way every time. Now this annoys people. And I talk to teachers and say, well, why isn't it working? I told you how to explain it. And that when I find out, or I listen to them on a tape or something, I find that they're trying to say it. I told you to let go, relax and come back. Next time I told you to let go, I told you to, um, uh, be lighter in your head or something. And they start changing the words. Well, see, here's the problem. Doesn't sound like much, does it? <laughs> but the problem is your brain doesn't talk to you the same way as we talk to each other. It doesn't dissect the meaning of things. It only takes an imprint and it notices if you're doing something the same way every single time then all of a sudden it will switch to automatic and it will make that happen for you. But if you change the words each time you're trying to explain it to the person, and you have to trust me on this, you might have to say it to that person 100 times the same way. And suddenly they'll come up to you and they'll say, you know what I found out last night? I found out that when I let go, if I relax, um, smile, and I smile and come back, I drop down a tiny bit each time. And you're supposed to be wow, that's a great discovery. <laughs> After trying to tell them for 150 times, that's how it works. Yeah, that's how it works.
So you have to figure it out um, for yourself on that. Okay. Now, uh, let's do. Let's take a look here. I don't know what time it is. Does anybody know what time it is right now? Four. Okay. So we went from three to four. Let's see how far we can go with Gunter's um, Gunter's uh, questions here because he sent me some questions. When I'm radiating meta to six directions, should it be from the upper head, like wearing a crown, or from inside my head? My my comment is don't worry about it. It's inside your head. You don't play with creating things or imagining things or anything like this, like a crown on your head or any kind of scene or act or anything. You don't do any of that stuff. You just, it's inside you. The actual thing is, if you know what an aura is, an aura is around the person's body and that's your, your vibration, your, your frequency shining off of you. And the meta, as you're developing it in your head, is shining and it's starting to come out in your aura. It's starting to shine. And no, you can't, unfortunately, look in the mirror and see it. <laughs> you can't do that. But, you, you know, you, you have to, if you want to imagine that you're shining, you just imagine you're smiling and you look at these little kids playing the shining game with their songs and things. They're just shining. And that's what you have to do. And as an adult, we find that extremely hard. And in the computer age, we find it is just not difficult enough. It's not complex. There must be a book that shows me five pages of how to do this. And there's not. You just shine. You go out and play. I don't know where you live, but um, I would go to the beach and take my shoes off and run back and forth and just laugh like crazy and start seeing kids look at me like I was silly and that's the beginning of it. You just have to just be there in the moment and play. You have to play. That's how you let go of all the stress and all the tension and everything. You let it go. And that's what you're doing. It's coming from the inside of your head. When the meta changes into compassion, it seems that the power of meta becomes weaker, which I did describe for you. And as a result, restlessness appears. Now that's your personal dislike of seeing it not be as strong. And that's your personal um, aversion to letting it just be there. You, you feel like I want to control it. Give up any idea about I want to control it and measure it and make it exact. It's not a piano. You don't have to, you know, <laughs> I don't know if that was a good one. I don't know. But, you know, just have fun with this. Okay. And just um, don't over, over, complex it uh, over make it complex and as a result restlessness appears we'll just let go of that and smile at it it's just you personally wanting to make something and control it radiating compassion is not like what's told in the book i don't know about what book you mean you want to tell me what book it is gunter which one the the pet to nibana Okay, well, there were things in there that I don't know which edition you have, but it's been re-edited now twice or three times. So I don't know, but, but um, you know, uh, what's told in the book, mm, let's see, like what's told in the book, the oh, the head seems bigger. The first edition mixed up, I noticed that, mixed up um, the talking about infinite space, which is the head feels bigger. That means that you're, you're close to entering infinite space, but that doesn't have anything to do um, with it, with the with the uh, meta becoming weaker or the karuna coming softer. These are two different things. You understand? Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. What, what should I do? Well, did it really become compassion or am I just tipped off at the, uh, off from the, um, from the fourth jhana. Yeah, you're just, <laughs> you're just, um, you're just too, getting too personal with it. Step back. Almost always when uh, people are overly concerned about it's too strong, it's too weak, it's too big, it's too wide, it's too this, it's too that. Well, the message here is stop controlling and just start witnessing and just watching it. And then you want, you notice when you're not watching and you let go and start smiling and laughing at yourself because I'm I have to control it. I have to tune it. I have to make it, you know, radio stations where they have to be on the exact point and stuff 
don't do that, okay? Just enjoy it, okay? All right, and the next one, let's see, the next one, um, is, I don't know how I do this now. Let's see how I do this. I don't know. You know what, Bonte? now I don't know how, oh, maybe I get here. Here we go. Um, Down and function. I got it, okay. So when we begin radiating meta to the six directions, is it directly going to the fourth jhana? Now, I'm not sure what that means, but you're past the fourth jhana, when you're, well, you're in the fourth jhana when you're in infinite space. I don't know if anybody explained this to you, but there's actually four jhanas, not eight. There's four. And then the subcategories for the fourth jhana are infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothingness, and neither perception or non-perception. It's a, it's a tricky thing because um, the, uh, the fourth jhana encompasses those other pieces, you see. And the modern version of it is we decided to call them eight, you see? So the fourth jhana, the purpose of the fourth jhana is to stabilize your equanimity strong enough so that you can pass through the mental states. So I used to play a game like this, you know, on my hand. I used to say, here's a one, whoops, they're not gonna see this. <laughs> Wait, I might have to turn this off for a second just to be able to show you how this works. If I can, let's see. Uh, yeah, turn this off. Um, let me change the background for just a second. Okay, look, watch. On my hand, there's a one, here's a one um, somewhere. I don't know why that's funny. <laughs> let me try it this way. All right, here. On a one-footed animal like this, and it can tip and fall down really easily. That's how much equanimity that you have in the first jhana. In the second jhana, you have this much too, and a two-leg, it can still fall down both ways, right? And in, in, in the uh, next one, in the third jhana, you have three-legged animal, but it's like a tripod. It can fall down in three directions. If you ever had a, a situation where you put your tripod up and the wind came up, you can be in trouble you know, with your uh, camera. And then all of a sudden you get a four footed animal like this, four feet and four feet when there's four feet, um, you know, under the animal is really solid. And the purpose of talking about equanimity in the fourth jhana is because of what has to happen after that. And what has to happen is you have to be very, very still and you have to be never minding anything that comes up around you and letting everything go, not being concerned with anything in order to pass through the uh, infinite uh, space and infinite consciousness and nothingness. And, and then it gets a little different in the last level and the eighth level. But that kind of gives you an idea of, of, how, um, of how that works, okay? Now let's go back here. Um, we can go back, hmm? yeah. There. Hmm? Okay. All right. So now we go back to this on the screen. Let me get here and we come back to here. Okay. Um, all right. So that's about your fourth jhana. Okay. Number four was what should I do when? Uh, radiating meta to six directions is not strong enough from the beginning. Well, that was a judgment call on your part. And I think I've explained it to you because now you understand, you should understand that the, uh, when you, when the meta turns into Karuna, Karuna is soft like cotton, but um, meta is more like more stronger and more, what you would say, like a form almost, <laughs> it's like that. But the other one is, is like cotton and it's very soft, okay? So it doesn't need a lot of strength, okay? Uh, and then we go, what should we watch? When, when should we watch? No, I'm sorry. When should we just watch our mind and smile? All day long, Gunter, all day long. Everywhere you go with everybody, with every interaction that you have, you should be smiling and you should watch your mind. Just, just watch it to see what happens. 
And if you jerk and have an opinion like that, you'll smile and laugh and let it go and just relax, smile and come back. Let go, relax, smile, come back. You just say, never mind, let go, relax, smile, come back like that. Okay. And you get lighter and lighter with this. After all, things don't really matter, do they? Why? Sister Kama, why doesn't it matter? <laughs> it doesn't matter because in a few minutes it's going to change. And that is a Nietzsche. And when a Nietzsche is involved, everything is changing all the time. So if something's going to change in a few minutes, then why take this minute seriously to the extent that you're going to go like that and, uh, and get all tight and, uh, you know, or angry or anything, let it go. And you have to laugh at yourself in the beginning because your mind has been accustomed to however you have treated this, however you have managed it through your life. And what you're going to do now is to identify that pattern of behavior. And now you're going to introduce a counter behavior and whatever it is somebody said or did or whatever happened, forgive them right away. Forgive them right there in your mind. Just forgive that. And, and it was an accident and it wasn't on purpose. And that's the position you take, even if it was on purpose. Who cares? Because in a few minutes, everything's going to change. You see? So you just let it go. And then um, here's another question. When we radiate metta to six directions from the head, it is said that the metta will not be going down to the heart again. Is that, does that mean that we will never experience the first and third jhana anymore? No, it doesn't mean that you're following a path. And once you have gone through these levels, you can experience them again. And it is interesting that, um, it is interesting that if you're in say nothingness, okay, like I can, well, I can't really show you because I don't, well, maybe I can, I can do it on the, on the share screen a minute. Um, no, wait a second. All right, stop the share. All right, I'm not sure if I can do this. I always get mixed up because I had two computers and one I could touch and one I couldn't. So I'm going to go to the whiteboard and see if I can, oh, I can play. I can do this much for you. Okay. So, um, okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go like this and I'm going to go uh, like this and I'm going to say to you, you know, this is your line. Okay. And this is your levels. Okay. Yeah, pretty good here. <laughs> okay. So this is um, one and this is two. And this is three, and this is four. And this is um, infinite space. And this is infinite consciousness. And this is nothingness. And this is the big show off, neither perception <laughs> nor non-perception and then this is where you go off the edge and go down to cessation and then you turn back on come back up like this when you turn back on this is where nibbana happens and that's like an opening experience of the mind just opening up okay and it's kind of like the rebooting of your computer when that occurs. And it's sort of like it's pushing your computer back to the default reading so that everything works in your computer after I got it stuck for the 50th time. <laughs> okay. All right. So, so here we go. So you learned about one, two, three, four. And you also learned that meta, okay, is the absolute, is the the this topic metta is the object of meditation for the first four of these but it's not absolute but that they're trying to show you this is how it works and then here when you go into infinite space and it's right about here 
that you are losing all your body parts between three and a half and four and a half is where you're lo losing all, you begin to lose feeling in your body. And then your head feels big and then you slip over into like infinite space. You pass over when your head's feeling full, that's where you know, oh, if I watch in there and just be very, very quiet, very, very still, you can see uh, way, 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 way in the distance, a vast distance, there is no horizon and everything is moving away from us in there. It's very freaky, kind of strange feeling because you think you're the center, but you have some things to learn as you go along. <laughs> so in here in infinite space, this is where Karuna is, where compassion is. This is where, um, you know, uh, joy is. We can say joy is here, okay. <laughs> that was good. I didn't do that one so well. Well, it's, it's pretty clear. I'm not going to quit and go do some kind of design work. All right, <laughs> joy. And then this nothingness is um, equanimity, okay? It's the equanimity. I'm not going to do this whole thing. I'm just going to go like this. So what I'm wanting to show you is this, that once you get into these mental states here, you can practice. If you're bored one day, you can practice and you can do something like you sit here. And when you're, when you're sitting before you start, you're right here. Okay. And you say, I will sit no higher than the fourth jhana. That's how you must say it. You do not say, I want to sit in the fourth jhana. You don't say, I will sit in the fourth jhana. You don't say, I'm going to sit in the fourth jhana for so long. You don't do that. You say, I will sit no higher than. We do not know why this works, but they really understand it, <laughs> whoever they are. And it seems to work most of the time, about 90% of the time. You say, I will sit no higher than the third jhana, or I will sit no higher than, you can say infinite space. Let's do that one so I can show you what happens. So you say, I will sit no higher than infinite space, and you sit and you go like this to get there, but you don't realize it. Okay, you don't realize it because what's happening is it's going like that one, two, three, four, infinite space. Once your mind has visited one of these levels, it claims a familiarity with that level, and then it feels comfortable enough to go like that. So, if I was going to infinite consciousness, it would be the same thing. If I was going to infinite consciousness here, it would be boom, boom bump, 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 like there I am in infinite consciousness, see? But you don't feel it. You do not climb it. We don't spend time with that until later on. We, uh, after a person has gone all the way through one time, then the, then the mind has a lot more uh, cooperation. The brain has a lot more cooperation with the person. But right now you should, you should practice what we call determinations. So these are called, watch this boy, I'll tell you, D term. <laughs> I hope you're all watching this. Nations. <laughs> oh, well, we're not going to sell anything by doing this, right? Okay. So here, determinations. That's what these are called, determinations. I will sit no higher than. And why do we do them? Well, we do them because we like infinite space and we want to sit there for a while. So you sit there. It's a very restful state. I did it once when I had an accident. I just decided to say, I'm going to sit here until people come and I'm going to sit in infinite space and I couldn't feel anything. And there was a tree on top of me. <laughs> and so it was a good thing to do. Preoccupied my mind until people came. And then uh, infinite consciousness, um, you can sit there. It's fun because if you learn to be able to watch the consciousnesses, it's, in, it's fun to be able to attempt to watch underneath where the consciousnesses are coming up. They're coming up like this, like one, boom, 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 boom. And if you start watching underneath where the next one's going to come up, you can see what's happening that makes it come up. And you can practice things like that. And all of this stuff translates into some neat stuff later on. But you first have to learn the keyboard before you can play the concerto. <laughs> okay. That's what all of this is about. You know, that's what all of it's about. 
So I'm going to throw the floor open right now because I don't know how long people have. You need to tell me. I think people need to let me know because um, Bonte's people need to let me know because I can do 78 still, but um, there's no exit the screen. Huh? Exit this uh, screen. Oh, exit the screen. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that answer your question, Gunter, about that last thing? okay yeah thank you so much sister Kema, for your guidance and answer it really helped okay. me clear things up oh great can i need to know how many people can stay how do we do this bunty because this is like four pages and i think i can get through it by skipping a couple parts but there's no turn backs go ahead i think so because uh, it is only one and a half hours now About okay 20 minutes Okay, so this is Samana Mandika uh, Sutta, number 78. And um, you listen because you're going to hear a lot about um, what's going on. And this has our friend Panjakanga in, in here. Uh, so thus I have heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was living in Sawati and Jetta's Grove, Anapa Pindika's Park. And on that occasion, in Malika's Park, the single hold Tinduka plantation for philosophical debates together with a large following of wanderers with as many as 300 wanderers. So the carpenter Panjakango went out from Sawati at midday in order to see the blessed one. And then he thought it is not the right time to see the blessed one. He is still in retreat. And it is not the right time to see the bhikkhus worthy of esteem because they are still in retreat. Must be during the rains retreat this is happening. Suppose I went to Malika's park to the wanderer Ugahamana, Samana Mandikaputa. And he went to Malika's park. Now, on that occasion, the wanderer Ugamana was seated with a large assembly of wanderers who were making an uproar loudly and noisily talking about many kinds of pointless talks. Okay, now this is something where people want to know sometimes about how to be, why you have to be quiet at retreats. Just one second here, I got something right here. Well, I don't know if I can find it. I don't know if I can. <laughs> anyway, we'll just we'll skip that part. <laughs> it tell it's a list of things you're not allowed to talk about when you're at a retreat, and it's kind of funny to read this whole thing because by the time you finish reading it, you can't think of anything there is to talk about. It's in one paragraph, and it's quite funny. But anyway. We'll let that go. Um, you shouldn't be talking about such things as kings and planets and this and that and the earth and the origination and all of it, whether things are so or not so, etc. And the wanderer Ugamana, Samanamandika Puta, he saw the carpenter Panjakango coming in the distance and seeing him, he quieted his own assembly thus. He said, sirs, be quiet. Sirs, make no noise. Here comes the carpenter Panjikanga. He is a disciple of the recluse Gotama, one of the recluse Gotama's white clothed lay disciples staying at Sawati. And these venerable ones like quiet. They are disciplined in quiet. They command quiet. Perhaps if he finds our assembly a quiet one, he will think to join us. And then the wanderers became silent and the carpenter Panjakanga went to the wanderer and exchanged greetings with him. And when this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and the wanderer said to him, carpenter, when a man possesses four qualities, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, 
an ascetic invincible attained to supreme attainment. What are the four? Here, he does no evil bodily actions. He utters no evil speech. He has no evil intentions, and he does not make his living by an evil livelihood. When a man possesses these four qualities, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, an ascetic invincible attained to the supreme attainment. Then the carpenter Panjakanga neither approved nor disapproved of the wanderer. And without doing either, he rose from his seat and he went away thinking, I shall learn the meaning of this statement in the presence of the blessed one. So he went to the blessed one and after paying homage to him, he sat down on one side and he reported to the blessed one his entire conversation with the wanderer. And thereupon the blessed one said, now, if that were so carpenter, then a young tender infant lying prone is accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, an ascetic invincible attained to the supreme attainment according to the wanderer statement. But for a young tender infant lying prone, it does not even have the notion of a body. So how should he do an evil bodily action beyond mere wriggling? A young tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion speech. And so how should he utter evil speech beyond mere whining? A young and tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion or intention. So how should he have evil intentions beyond merely sulking? A young and tender infant lying prone does not even have the notion livelihood. And so how should he make his living by evil livelihood beyond being suckled in his mother's breast? And if that were so, Carpenter, then the young, tender infant lying prone is accomplished in what is wholesome, according to the wanderer. Well, when a man possesses four qualities, Carpenter, I describe him not as accomplished in what is wholesome or perfected in what is wholesome or an ascetic invincible attained to the supreme attainment but as one who stands in the same category as the young tender infant lying prone. So what are the four? Here, he does no evil bodily actions. He utters no evil speech. He has no intentions and he does not make his living by an evil livelihood. When a man possesses these four qualities, I describe him not as accomplished but as one who stands in the same category as the young, tender infant lying prone. Now, when a man possesses 10 qualities, Carpenter, I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is um, wholesome, and ascetic, invincible, attained to the supreme attainment. But first of all, I say it must be understood thus, these are unwholesome habits and thus unwholesome habits originate from this. And thus unwholesome habits cease without remainder and thus one practicing in this way is practicing to the cessation of unwholesome habits. And I will say it must be understood thus, these are wholesome habits and thus wholesome habits originate from this and thus wholesome habits cease without remainder here. And thus one practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of wholesome habits. When you're practicing your right effort, you are practicing to secure wholesome habits and let go of all your unwholesome habits. And I say that it must be understood thus. These are unwholesome intentions and thus unwholesome intentions originate from this. 
and thus unwholesome intentions will cease without remainder here. And thus, one practicing in this way is practicing the way to the cessation of unwholesome intentions. And I say it must be understood thus. These are wholesome intentions. Thus, wholesome intentions will originate from this. And thus, wholesome intentions cease without remainder here. One practicing in this way is practicing the way to cessation of the wholesome intentions. So what are unwholesome habits? They are unwholesome bodily actions, unwholesome verbal actions, and evil livelihood. These are called unwholesome habits. And what do these unwholesome habits originate from? Their origin is stated. They should be said to originate from the mind. What mind? Though mind is multiple, varied, and has different aspects. There is mind affected by lust, by hate, and by delusion. Unwholesome habits originate from this. And where do these unwholesome habits cease without remainder? These, their cessation is stated. Here, a monk abandons bodily misconduct. He develops good bodily conduct. He abandons verbal misconduct. He develops good verbal conduct. He abandons mental misconduct and develops good mental conduct. And he abandons wrong livelihood and gains a living by right livelihood. It is here that unwholesome habits will cease without remainder. And how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of unwholesome habits? Here, a monk awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of unarisen, evil, unwholesome states. And he makes an effort, arouses his energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. He knows the instructions, and he strives to, do, to follow these instructions step by step, the four pieces I taught you. He awakens enthusiasm for the abandoning, the release of the arisen evil unwholesome states. And he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. And he awakens enthusiasm for the continuance, the non-disappearance and the strengthening, increase and fulfillment by development of the arisen wholesome states. And he makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. And one so practicing practices the way for the cessation of wholesome habits. And what are wholesome habits? They are wholesome bodily actions, wholesome verbal actions, purification of livelihood. These are called the wholesome habits. And what do these wholesome habits originate from? Their origin is stated. They should be said to originate from mind. What mind? Though mind is multiple, varied, and different aspects, there is mind unaffected by lust, unaffected by hate, and unaffected by delusion. Wholesome habits originate from this. And where do the wholesome habits cease without remainder? Their cessation is stated here, a monk is virtuous, but he does not identify with his virtue. And he understands as it actually is that deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom where these wholesome habits will cease without remainder. And how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of wholesome habits? Here, a monk awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of the unarisen evil and wholesome states. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, he puts up his energy and where is it? I can't find it. <laughs> it's really funny. I hate it when they do this. Okay, effort here makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives for the continuance and the non-disappearance, the strengthening increase in fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states. He makes effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind and strives. 
and one so practicing practices the way to cessation of wholesome states. Now, what are the unwholesome intentions? They are the intention of sensual desire, the intention of ill will, the intention of cruelty. These are called unwholesome intentions. What to do uh, these unwholesome intentions originate from? They are, the or origin is stated, they should be said to originate from perception. What perception? Though perception is multiple, varied, and of different aspects, there is perception of sensual desire and perception of ill will and perception of cruelty. Unwholesome intentions originate from this. And where do these unwholesome intentions cease without remainder? Their cessation is stated. Here, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters and abides in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. It is here that unwholesome intentions will cease without remainder. And how practicing does he practice the way to the cessation of unwholesome intentions? Here, a monk awakens enthusiasm for the non-arising of the unarisen, unwholesome states, and he exerts his energy for the continuance, non-disappearance, strengthening, increase, and fulfillment by development of arisen, wholesome states. And he makes an effort, arouses energy, exerts his mind, and strives. And so practicing, he, uh, he practices the way to the cessation of unwholesome intentions. And what are the wholesome intentions? They are the intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, the intention of non-cruelty. These are called wholesome intentions. And what do these wholesome intentions originate from? Their origin is stated and they should be said to originate from perception. What perception? Remember, perception perceives, it names things. Though perception is multiple, varied, and different aspects of it, there is perception of renunciation, perception of non-ill will, perception of non-cruelty, and wholesome intentions originate from this. And where do these wholesome intentions cease without remainder? Their cessation is stated here with the stilling of, a of thinking and examining thought. Monk enters upon and abides in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and collectedness of mind without a thinking and examining thought. With joy and happiness, born of profitable concentration. I always put that in. In the, the Sudhimaga, it tells us the concentration that he talks about in the whole thesis of, or the whole um, collection that he wrote and he put together. The whole thing is about profitable concentration. So profitable concentration means a profitable level and degree and tone of concentration. Now, Bhante chose to say collectedness and he's not the first one that did it either. I found older monks that did this also. Collectedness of mind works better instead of saying concentration because in so many cultures, concentration means to really do something really hard. And we grew up in this time, that's the way it is now. It is here that these wholesome intentions will cease without remainder. And how practicing does he practice the way of cessation of the wholesome intentions? Here, a monk will awaken enthusiasm for the non-arising of the unarisen evil unwholesome states. And he will practice for the continuance and non-disappearance and strengthening and increase and fulfillment by development of arisen wholesome states. So it isn't that we just bring up a wholesome state one time and just let it go. It's that we practice it continually. So what he discovered, I mean, the Buddha back then, okay, was he was, in my opinion anyway, 
the father of neurocognitive science or cognitive psychology. And in the cognitive science, they have come to the point, they understand that a brain can be retrained in habitual behavior patterns. And because of that, guess what? Nobody, nobody here, nobody where you are, nobody anywhere is stuck anymore. It just means that you can change. Nobody can tell you, you can't change. If you make the effort and learn how it's done, it might take you a little longer if you're over 25 and you're doing this, but you can do it. And they know it now. They tricked with all different age group people. He practices through the continuance, the non-disappearance, the strengthening and the increase and fulfillment of development of a risen wholesome state. And he makes an effort, arouses his energy, exerts his mind, and he strives. And one so practicing practices the way to the cessation of wholesome intentions. Now, Carpenter, when a man possesses these 10, what 10 qualities do I describe him uh, as accomplished in what is wholesome, perfected in what is wholesome, an ascetic invincible attained to the supreme attainment. Here, a monk possesses the right view of one beyond training. It means that you see things impersonally. You don't take anything personally. If you apply and examine uh, the, um, the one um, sutta number nine, when it talks about the different um, uh, parts of the Eightfold Path and such in there, you'll see that if you were to choose not to take anything personally anymore, your whole world would change and you would forgive and use compassion and decide to go in the direction of, of loving kindness. The right intention of one beyond training, right speech of one beyond training, right action of one beyond training, right lifestyle of one beyond training, right effort of one beyond training, the right mindfulness of one beyond training, the right level of concentration of one beyond training, and the right knowledge of one beyond training, and the right deliverance of one beyond training. When a man possesses those 10 qualities, then I describe him as accomplished in what is wholesome perfected in what is wholesome, an ascetic who is invincible, attained to the supreme attainment in line for be, being able to experience the opening of the mind, the resetting, the rebooting of the computer and opening up. When that happens, and for those of you who are just starting to practice with us some, uh, you know, what, what happens when you go in this experience of Nibbana is like an opening. It's like a resetting, as I say, a rebooting of a, a computer. And when that happens, one has a very clear view. Well, how long does it last? As long as you take care of it. If you fall back into old habits this way and this way, from worrying, you know, having sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair about the past, or you go into worrying and worrying about the future too much, then it, it shortens the length of time that that experience can serve you. But it's just like we, uh, I was teaching a bunch of women last uh, September, and they said, you know, this is a, a lot like if you, at the hospital, you have a baby, and the mother and father are there, and the doctors and nurses, but when they leave, they take the baby and they go home. And what the baby turns into, how the baby uh, prospers and grows up and how it develops or not is totally up to the parents and how they take care of it. Well, this is the same thing. And I've had people have the first experience and have it last a month. I've had people have the first experience and have it last three days, you see? So why? Because they're not paying attention to how to take care of it. And if they let the world come in and close in on them and, and, and these things come in and not handle them in the right way, which is what it's explaining to you, keep using the steps of right effort and you will change your habitual tendencies and they will shift. 
and they will serve you and they will serve you well. So this is about the end. Does anybody have any questions? We didn't throw out two questions, but does anybody have any questions? Okay. So if you have a question, you can write us. Um, and let's see, there was a couple things on the chat. Let me see if somebody wrote something on the chat here. Oh, that's just, we are here. Yep, we were. Okay. <laughs> that's good. We made it and we're here. Okay. So, um, so let's say a prayer and we will close the meeting. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power, share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.